Last time we developed diagnostic positions for the horizontal cylinder and the sphere, both of which were vertically polarized. And I left you with a problem to figure out what the depth to the center of the vertically polarized sphere is that produces this anomaly. And these are the uh, <clears throat> diagnostic positions, the values of x over z, and the depth index multipliers. We showed you how to get these. We'll spend a minute, we'll come back and we'll recap uh, computation of x over z. But first, what did you get for the, for the depth? And um, hopefully you got 1.75 meters. So I only use three of the diagnostic positions here. Um, at three quarters, one half, and one third. And they were fairly consistent, so I think we probably conclude that it was, you know, about about 1.75 meters down to the center of the sphere that's producing this anomaly. And I reduced the extent of the, the anomaly here from minus three to three meters, so it's a fairly localized anomaly. But uh, uh, you should have gotten gotten this this depth, 1.75 meters. Hopefully that worked out for you. I did want to just come back and mention the um, Excel solver approach for determining these diagnostic uh, positions. And remember we had in the case of the horizontal cylinder here, we have this expression in order to calculate diagnostic positions. We're asking at what value of x or x over z does the anomaly fall to one half of its maximum value. So, or one third or whatever, whatever, you, whatever it is that you're interested in as a diagnostic position. And to simplify the approach, I just um, eliminated the z by assuming that it's equal to one. And I did this for both the cylinder and for the sphere, and then using solver, uh, we were easily able to calculate what is kind of a messy algebraic problem here. So let me let me just uh, kind of quickly come back to Excel and go through this again. And um, I'm just I'm going to um, going to bring up uh, Solver. And so we have a Solver screen here and. The objective cell is the cell that you're going to throw um, a that you're you're trying to solve for, and you know in this case we were trying to solve for a value of 0.75, and so this formula that we have in here is the formula that solver is going to vary in order to come up with the value. 0.75, and when it does, it's going to put the value of x over z that it obtains in this variable cell. And notice there's um, uh, notice that, that there's just simply a value in there. So we have a formula here. Uh, that formula comes from this equation here because we're working with the cylinder. We could do the same for the sphere, which you know, I have have down here. I have this formula uh, typed in. And again, it's just a matter of specifying the cell. In this case, it would be E13. And we'd be putting the uh, value into the cell D13 instead of D3. So that's the, um, that's, that's the basic idea there. And I just wanted to come back and briefly take a, uh, take a look at that. See if you had any uh, if, you, if you had any questions about that, and um, so we're going to take a look at a problem. Uh, you know, I mentioned we do a problem the, in the last video, and in this problem we've got a buried stone wall. This problem comes from a problem that's presented by Berger, uh, Sheehan, and Jones in their Introduction to Applied Geophysics uh, text. And it's it's been uh, it's been modified, but it's uh, similar. 
And so you've got a, it's an archaeological exploration problem, 0 0.001 CGS uh, units. And uh, the main field intensity at this location is 55,000 nanoteslas. And the, the idea is to determine whether a proton precession magnetometer can actually detect this uh, feature. Now, Berger et al. suggests that one use a sphere to determine de detectability. But, you know, think about a wall. The wall will extend significant distances in and out of. You, you would also think that the isolated sphere would underestimate the extent of the uh, structure and also the magnitude of the anomaly. Another thing, the, another modification I made is that let's assume that, you know, this might be a fairly noisy day, but let's assume that we have plus or minus five nanoteslas of uh, background noise. Um, you know, micro pulsations, maybe a little bit of a magnetic storm or something like that. So we're going to take two, those two different approaches and see what we come up with. So we're, we're going to, in order to do this, uh, since both the cylinder and the sphere are represented in terms of circular cross-sections there, we have to figure out what the equivalent uh, radius is. And so to represent the rectangular uh, cross-section in circular form, you need to determine the uh, radius of an equivalent uh, or of a circle having the same area. And the area of the circle, obviously, pi r squared, so the equivalent radius is just the square root of the area of the wall here, which is 1 times 0.5 or 1.5 meters divided by pi. So we get 0.5 meters squared, and uh, that would give us an r of approximately 0.4 meters. Now the z that we would use, well, whether it's a cylinder or a sphere or a rectangular rod, uh, the the wall is concentrated at this depth at, at 1.75 meters. So, so we really don't change that. We really shouldn't change that. We don't want the depth 1.5 to be to to the top of a sphere with a 0.5, because it'll go down down here. We want it to be centered at uh, 1.75 meters. So. Uh, so that would just be something to, to consider before you move any further. And then uh, at this point, you should calculate the anomalies associated with the um, sphere and the cylinder. And you might pause and um, you know, try to calculate these. And again, determine detectability <clears throat> in terms of uh, the background noise of plus or minus 5 nanoteslas. So in doing this, we... Uh, for the horizontal cylinder, we come up with an anomaly which is about 18 nanoteslas. For the sphere, not surprisingly, we come up with a much smaller anomaly which is only you know, about 5.4 nanoteslas. And you, I kind of referenced the noise level here. You can see that for the cylinder, the anomaly associated with the wall is likely to extend above the background noise significantly by oh, about 13 nanoteslas or so. In the case of the sphere, you, you might conclude if you just calculated this one point, now I've calculated the entire curve here. You only calculated these two, two values, perhaps, from these, these formula. But you can see over here in the case of the sphere that, well, it is above the noise level, <clears throat> but would you detect it? Uh, if there's a lot of background scatter, uh, probably not. This is a real, we're only about 0.4 nanoteslas above the background. And uh, so uh, this extent here is probably around 0.5 meters. Over here we have about 2.4 meters above the background. So if you were using this idea, if you were using the sphere to evaluate whether a magnetic survey would work for you, you would probably abandon magnetics in favor of something else, uh, ground penetrating radar, maybe. So um, what did you conclude? Peak anomalies, 18 nanoteslas, 5.5 nanoteslas. But uh, if you just calculate those values, you might say, OK, well, you know, I can probably detect it. But uh, consider that the peak anomaly is not the only detection criteria the extent of the anomaly above the noise level will be critical to detection. And I would also say it's um, 
uh, you know, its, it's, it's width, uh, extent above, and, uh, uh, of course, its uh, uh, breadth relative to the, to the noise level. Uh, is it just a little speck that pops up above the background noise that you may not even have a sample point there? Uh, mentioned in the previous slide, you'd probably have to have sampled at every 10, 20 centimeters at least in order to have a chance of seeing this anomaly. Over here, you could probably sample at about a half a meter spacing and be able to pick this anomaly out. So, a few things to consider. Uh, and I think the horizontal cylinder is, is certainly much more representative of the uh, of the wall and its uh, geometry and configuration. So, so this would be a different approach to that problem and you'd come up with a different answer. Uh, so the next time we're going to be looking at anomalies that are produced over buried plates and we'll start looking at a strip of negative poles and um, integrate over the top and the base of the plate which will carry out to um, some distance uh, well, initially we'll carry it out to infinity in all directions and then we'll taper it off so that we're looking at a uh, plate with limited extent that extends to infinity in two directions but, but uh, is, or to a large distance in two directions, but is limited in uh, one of the directions. So this could be X and it would be limited in the Y direction. So uh, we'll talk about that next time. Thanks for joining us. See you then.